Glad you're here. Happy New Year. Before we lived in Lincoln, we lived in uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, home of Fort Huachuca. We had a number of soldiers who went to our church, and so I would go out and visit them on post. And I was um, pleasantly surprised at the ease of interaction between the officers and the enlisted soldiers. They would always sir or ma'am, if it was an officer, but would call him or her LT, short for lieutenant, and, and there just seemed to be a good camaraderie. Well, I was surprised one day when I came home, and Hope had been on base. There was a, a Burger King there, and she'd been there with her younger son, and she was walking out, and uh, apparently some enlisted soldier did not recognize an officer, and man, he dressed him down, soldier, do you know how to salute? Yes, sir, well, why didn't you salute? I don't know, sir, and just let him have it. So the next time I saw one of these soldiers who was in our church, I, I said, explain that to me. And he said, Andy, my guess is, this was a new recruit, the Fort Huachuca had the military intelligence schools, school, so people out of basic would come there for what they call AIT. And when you were a newer recruit, they went through what they called soldierization. And the soldierization was this. It was very simple. You get an order, you follow it. You don't think about it. You don't consider it. You just do it. And he said, once you get that down, we're good. <laughs> but until we're sure that you have it, that you get an officer from a superior officer, you execute it without question, we got an issue. And the soldierization process will continue. And he said, if you're going to be successful in the U.S. Army, the U.S. Armed Forces, you, you have to get this. And it's built into you that you follow an order. Well, as we think about 2020, I want to talk about what God wants to build into us. Uh, there's something he wants there, uh, even much more than the, the army wants the, 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 the understanding of authority. And, and I want to talk about that today. So if you've got a Bible, if you'd open it to John chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1, uh, go through verse 15, then pick up verses 28 through 30. And as we do this, we're going to, I'm going to have us wrestle with this question, what is it? Jesus want to build into us? What does Jesus want to build into me, and what does Jesus want to build into you in 2020? So our passage starts with this way. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So he's coming back from Jerusalem into Galilee, and it says, a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. And so, man, Jesus is getting an audience, but they have seen that or they have heard that Jesus is healing the sick, and they're thinking, man, what might Jesus do for me? Man, what might he do for my loved one? What might he do for... It says, then Jesus went up on the mountain there, and he sat with his disciples. This was a chance to get away. Uh, we're going to find out that doesn't last long. Uh, verse 4, we get this other um, note about the time period. It says, now the Passover... The feast of the Jews was near. Passover was the most celebrated Jewish religious holiday. It celebrated the fact that, that God indeed passed over Israel when they were enslaved in Egypt. God said the firstborn of every household will die. He was trying to convince the leader of Egypt, the Pharaoh, to let Israel go. And this was the final sign. And, and in fact, he did that. The firstborn in every Egyptian house died, but not in the Jewish home. And, and, and then the the nation was then liberated after 400 years of being enslaved, liberated from Egypt. And so this holiday had spiritual significance, but also had national significance. Those who were zealots, those who were more nationalistic, were thinking maybe it's time for liberation from Rome. And so that is in play as Jesus is ministering among the people. In verse 5, we find out that uh, Jesus isn't going to be away with his disciples. The crowds are going to follow him. It says, verse 5, it says, Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes, seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? They've been out in the, the wilderness, and there's, there's nothing there. And high V Isles Online isn't getting out there. So we've got a problem. These people have been out, and, and what's, Philip, what do we do? 
Is Jesus, is he, is he at wit's end? Does, does he not know what to do? You find out in verse 6, there's a reason Jesus asked that question. It says, this he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. So Jesus got it figured out. But he wants to say, Philip, what are you thinking here? We got, we got a lot of folk. We're going to find out it's, it's about 5,000. They're coming and, and uh, they're hungry. What do you think? So he's testing Philip. And, and what specifically is he testing? He's testing, Philip, what are you going to do when the circumstances are overwhelming? What are you going to do when the circumstances are impossible? Philip, what do you think? So it's, it's a test. It's a, it's a one-question test. No partial credit on this, okay? And, and so it's, it's, you know, either Philip's, he's going to get 100, he's going to get an A, or he's going to get a zero, he's going to get an F, okay? And so that's what we're going to find out in verse 7. How does Philip do on the test? Well, here we go. Philip answered him, 200 denarii. Now understand, a day's wage for an average worker was one denarii. So he said, 200 days wages worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. You know how Philip thinks when he gets this question? He thinks in terms of money. We don't have enough money to feed them. So did Philip pass or did he fail? He failed. He failed miserably. Why? Because in this impossible circumstance, he thought on a very human level. What do we got? How much, how much money do we got? Uh, let's see. Oh, man. Jeez, we're really, we're really, really short here. You missed it. You missed it. I think that's worth considering. Because I'm guessing you have got an impossible, if you'll let me use that term, put it in quotes. You've got an impossible circumstance in your life. You got one that's overwhelming. You got a budget issue. You got a relational issue. You got a health issue. You know, I mean, it's just that the money's not adding up. That the doctor's report on the cancer is not good. That every kind of conflict resolution you work is not uh, is not reconciling you. It's not getting closer. What do we do in these impossible circumstances? It hasn't gotten solved. Uh, do we think Jesus is too busy? Maybe he doesn't care. So we, we just give up. What do we do in these impossible circumstances? We all got them. So I, I don't have a, a circumstance for, per se, but... But I have a need. I, I want to have the future figured out. I, I don't want any surprise. I don't want any difficulties. You, you with me on that? So, so when I was 10, I think it was about 10, I, I picked up, we were living in suburban Detroit. Uh, it's the first time I think I, roughly 10, I picked up things aren't good on my dad's job. And, and he could lose his job and, and, and we might have to move. And in fact, he did and he got a job in Toledo and that's just across the Ohio line and we're going to have to move. But now we got one in Detroit, so, so, so we're okay. But then at 13, he did lose that job, and then we had to move to the Chicago area. So that was the beginning of high school for me. And then he got, couldn't get along with his boss, so we lost that job. And we were going, oh, we've got another job in Chicago, but that only lasted a year. So long story short, as a junior, we got to move from the Chicago area to the Houston area. So I finished high school, and I go to A&M, and I'm coming home my freshman year. And he meets me at the front of the driveway. He said, Dad, I, he said, Andrew, I've taken a job in New York. Again, he'd lost that job. We're going to be moving, but we'll give you the option. And I think, man, I ain't moving again. I'm staying. But there's a lot of uncertainty there for me. And so I want to be able to control the future. Any little thing bothers me. So my wife works for Lincoln Public Schools. And in January, um, they have this option for a health savings account. And she's going to start putting some of her check there. Well, in December, the thing comes to set up your, set up your account, 
And uh, so she said, Andy, will you do that? Yeah, I will. And then there's going to be a debit card that comes from that. And so I check, I set it up, and they say the debit card's been put in the mail. So this is a week ago, Tuesday. So Wednesday, I go to the mailbox, and there's nothing there. And Thursday, I go to the mailbox, there's nothing there. And that's bothering me, because what do I need? I need control of the future, right? Now, understand, there's no money in that debit account yet, because she doesn't start contributing to January. So, So if somebody somehow gets the account, how much can they steal? Nothing, because there's no money in there. Well, what, what if they get our data or something like that? So a week ago, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm bothering. And then I get up Friday, and I get one of these, get one of these texts, these notifications. You know what the text notification said? We're mailing the debit card today. <laughs> so what did that worry about the future accomplish for me? Nothing. Nothing. And you know what God says to me? Andy, I'd like you to trust me with the future. That's hard. But, you know, for me, I don't know what it's like for you, what your circumstances. I think God wants to build into me a greater trust of you do what you can to plan for the future. You you plan, but in the end, you're going to have to trust me because you're not going to be able to figure it all out. So Philip fails the test. But in verses 8 and 9, we turn to Andrew. Now, anytime you see someone named Andrew, you can trust they're in sync with God, okay? If you get nothing else from this message, you take that. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad who has five barley oaves and two fish, but not like he has great faith here. What are these for so many people? But Andrew thinks, let's see what we got, and we'll bring it to Jesus. Who knows what he might do? So in your impossible circumstances, what do you got? Well, I got a job. I got, uh, I, I'm making connection with the, this person. I mean, when we're sending texts. Um, we got this doctor who's working. Well, I'm going to bring whatever that is. Jesus, here's what I got, and I'm trusting you. I'm bringing it to you. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus says, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the man sat down in number about 5,000. Remember, we got five loaves and two fish here. Then Jesus took the loaves and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also the fish as much as they wanted. And they go and they go and they go and they eat. And it says, verse 12 says, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments from five barley loaves which were left over those who had eaten. So everybody got enough to eat, and there are 12 baskets left over. 12 baskets, 12 tribes of Israel. Symbolic. God provides for his people. 12 baskets, 12 disciples. Speculation on my part, but I'm wondering, did each of the disciples carry a basket of leftovers? Just, Just wondering. What do you think was going through the disciples' mind as they were collecting leftovers after 5,000 were fed with five loaves and two fish? Why did Jesus ask that question of Philip? What was going through Philip's mind? Well, (laughs) these disciples, once he uh, was crucified and resurrected and ascended to heaven, they were on. They were going to lead the first century church. And they were going to have to trust him in some really hard circumstances. And in fact, 10 of them would die martyr's death. The 11th would be banished to an island of Patmos. You have to trust me in those. And Jesus is beginning that process in them. Just like I think he wants to build that process in me and you. So, So we're asking this question, what does Jesus want to build into us in 2020? Here's what I think. I, Jesus wants to build tr- our trust in him. That's more than anything I think he wants for you and for me in 2020. He wants you and me to trust him. So again, let me ask, what is the impossible issue? I don't see how this is going to work out, Andy. Jesus wants you to bring that, whatever you got, whatever doctor's report, whatever money, whatever job, whatever uh, communication you have, whatever you got, would you bring it to him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. Here's what I got. I'm trusting you. 
See what he does. See what he does. More than anything, Jesus wants to build our trust in him. Now here's where my opening illustration breaks down. The military, by, will admit, they want to break you down. So you trust in him. That's what they're going to do. Jesus ain't going to break you down. He's going to show himself to you. And he wants to build on the stuff he's done in your life. So you and I continue to grow to find out, as in our experience, he is more and more trustworthy. So can I ask you, what, where, where have you seen God show up in the last year or two or five of your life? Yeah, I mean, I continue to be amazed. We're 17 years in Lincoln now, 17 and a half. I didn't know. I mean, I've told you guys the whole job search thing when I was down in Arizona. I can't believe God brought me to this place. What if, is a faithful God going to abandon me? I don't think that's not his character. Where have you seen God show up? Because God wants trust to be the thing. That's your natural reaction. That's my natural reaction. It's what we do. It's who we are. So when I was down at Sierra Vista, there's an older gentleman in our church, retired military. He was uh, in the Army during World War II. He ended up being first wave on D-Day. His commanding officer freaked out. So as the ranking NCO, non-commissioned officer, he's in charge. I asked him about the movie Saving Private Ryan. He said he hated the beach scene was too real. I don't know why I'm alive. But he led his men, platoon, whatever he had. After uh, World War II, he got out and went into the Air Force. He went from the Army to the Air Force. So he was career military. And in the Air Force, he got to E-9. Now, if you've been in the Army, the Air Force, you know E is enlisted. Nine's as high as you can go. So he was the ranking enlisted officer on the base. So you probably have 12,000 soldiers on a base, maybe 8,000 enlisted, 4,000 officers. He, he was, of those 8,000, he was the ranking one. And with the general, he, he ran the base. He was career military, loved it. And he, he was a great friend to me. Um, on top of that, he was super nice to my kid. I had two. The one was born down there. But the little guy was, uh, our oldest was about a year and a half, and by four, by the end of the time. So he would always bring candy for my son, Chris. And so when Chris would come out of children's church, man, he is on a mission to find Mr. Jack, because Mr. Jack has candy for him. I think it's Jack's favorite part of the service, give my son candy. He just loved it, loved my kid. So I felt, I just, I felt great respect for this man, for his courage to serve in the military. And he was kind of, he was nice to me, he was kind to my kid. You know what he called me without fail? He called me sir. Do you know why? Because he was military. He was 30 years in the army, and chaplains were officers, so he called me sir. So I think, buddy, if, if there's ever a, one who should show deference, it's me to you, because you're, you're a senior to me, you, you served our country. So I thought I'd have this conversation one time. I said, you know, Jack, we're, we're brothers in Christ. You, know, you don't have to call me sir, you know, Andy. I, I, I don't want this barrier between us. I, just, I had that conversation one time. Because he told me, sir, this is who I am. And in my world, you were an officer. And I recognized your call, so I'm going to speak to you that way. Okay, that's the end of the conversation. But I, I just thought, you're 25 years retired from the army, and you still recognize authority. That's what God wants us. He wants us to bleed anywhere we cut. Just as he bleeds authority, we bleed trust. What's the circumstance? I don't know, but I trust God. That's what Jesus wants to build into us. And so those impossible circumstances that are coming your way, they're an opportunity. God wants to use those to grow your trust and my trust in him. Are we on board with what Jesus wants to do? Uh, verse 14, there's this response. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. And the Old Testament recognized there would be one prophet sent by God. 
And they're recognizing maybe Jesus is the fulfillment of this. But I think also in their mind, there's the, the idea that Moses, when the people were in the wilderness going to the promised land, the people were hungry, and, and God worked through Moses to provide manna. And so there's this idea, again, of this liberation that's coming in. And there's these nationalists that want the Romans gone. Verse 15, so Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him the king, withdrew the mountain by himself alone. See, these people have an agenda for Jesus. Maybe this guy, maybe, maybe this, this guy can do all this stuff. Maybe he can liberate us. And Jesus wasn't about liberating Israel from Rome. That wasn't his agenda. And I think here in the United States, we're a consumer-oriented culture and everybody works for us and don't you know we're the center of the world. We think we want to co-opt Jesus for our purposes. So we've got an impossible circumstance. If we want Jesus to guarantee this outcome or that outcome, I can't tell you he's going to do that. He might. But you think, you think if my faith, I'm going to get Jesus to do what I want for me, Jesus ain't interested. Not interested in that. He wants our faith carte blanche alone. I trust you no matter what the result because I know you're good. I know you're sovereign. I know you're in control. So whatever my impossible circumstances, I'm going to trust you with it. I'm not, I, I know what outcome I'd like, I'm going to ask for it, but even without that outcome, I'm going to trust you. Jesus is not interested in us co-opting him and shaping and molding him for our purpose. He wants our trust. And that comes very hard to us. We work for everything, but God says, I, I give you my approval freely, I want you to trust me. Well, the next day, Jesus goes... Um, across the sea, and the crowd follows him, and there's a discussion that begins in verse 26. It leads to what was known as the bread of life discourse, and I'm not going to read all the way through that, but in, in verse 27, he, you know, these are still people who are working. They've seen Jesus heal, and they think they want Jesus to work for them. And so Jesus says, do not work for the food which perishes, but work for the food which endures eternal life. So you, so you want a quick fix. I've got something greater. I've got, I can restore you with God, and, and, and I can restore your relationship and, and give you life eternal. So verse 28 is where I want to pick up, because they pick up on the idea of working for God. So they say, therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? In other words, what can we do? What can we favor? What, what, what can, I mean, do we help old ladies across the street? Do we give money? Do we, what do we do to, 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 to work your favor? And Jesus answered them in verse 29 and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You, you believe in me. You, you want to work from God, you put your full-on trust in me. Uh, that's not the answer they want, verse 30. So they said, uh, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Now, now remember, just yesterday, he fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. I mean, what do you need? And, and we see, remember John uh, 16, verse 2, they were following because Jesus had healed, was healing the sick. And in fact, in John chapter 5, he healed a guy who had been lame 38 years. And yet they're asking him for a sign. Why? Because you and I, humans, we, we don't want to put our full trust in God. We just want to say, hey, what, 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 what can we do for you? Interesting, Jesus had the most conflict with, with the religious people. That they had all these rules and regulations. You do this stuff, you work to God. Just, no, wait, those rules, and they don't work because your heart is, is, is messed up. You need to trust me and, and let me do a work from the inside out. I want you to trust me. That, you want to work, uh, the work is trust me. Uh, this summer, we were with some friends. And we vacationed with some friends in Minnesota, very gracious. They lived on a lake, and we were out in the boat, and over there was a college, and they said, um, the students park over there on the lake. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't see a parking lot. They said, no, 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 there, there's no parking lot. When the lake freezes over, they just drive across the lake, and they park there. I thought, whoa. You know, I don't know, come November or December, when they say, hey, we th think the ice is thick enough that I'm willing to drive my car out there. I better really trust the government official who's saying, I've done the work. Because, you know, if you go in and, and you can test the, and you walk and maybe you can test the thing and it cracks and, and you pull back, but, but you drive your vehicle out there and you find out it's too thin, I mean, you're, you're really in a tough, tough spot. 
but you got to put the full weight of you and your vehicle on that ice to trust. That's the kind of trust Jesus wants from you and me. I, I, I'm putting my full weight. I'm going all in with you, and I may not get what I want, and it may, uh, but I, what's our word? I'm trusting you. Jesus wants to build that in you and me so that we take him at his word. Back in the middle to late 90s, Hope and I were overseas serving as missionary, and, and of course missionaries, and we were keeping in touch with our parents. And I kept hearing from my mom, my arthritis is getting worse and worse, and the doctor wants to do a hip replacement surgery. And she kept putting that off and putting that off and putting that off. Because I thought, I think the thought of going in, we're going we're gonna to saw this out, we're going to throw that one away, and we're going to take a new one in, we're going to screw it in, and it's, it's going to be better. I just think she had a hard time believing that. So finally she schedules the surgery, and I think, I'll fly home for a week. We were in Chile, and uh, you know my dad had had a stroke and couldn't drive that well, so I'll be the go-between for a week, and I'll, I'll help out. And so I got home, and I, was just, I hadn't seen my mom in a couple of years. I, I was just in disbelief. To go from the stove to the, to the table was just, it was arduous. I mean, it's like a dog who'd been hit in a late broken leg. And so I, maybe I get there on a Thursday or a Friday and the surgery's on a Monday. And so uh, we go in and, and the, come, the surgeon comes out and he said, you know, I, surgery went well. Um, he said, I've been doing this a while. That may be the worst hip I've seen, or one of the worst. And, and so my mom comes out of surgery. About one o'clock, they get her up to walk. And not every surgery goes this way, but, but she walks and walks and walks. And, and the nurse said, you okay? Yeah, I'm walking and walking and walking. And the nurse said, stop. We're going to stop right now, and we're not going to write down exactly how far you walked because Medicare won't pay for your rehab. I mean, surgery, not every surgery goes this well, but, I mean, it was, man, it was a... Well, what do you think happened about a year later? Remember, she's got arthritis. The other hip goes bad. You know what she did the first time the doctor said, I think you might need surgery. You know what my mom said? Let's do it. Let's do it. But I mean, she put that first surgery off for about two years, much to her detriment. Why? She did not what? She didn't trust that doctor. But she'd seen one hip go well. So when the doc said, I think we need surgery. Okay, let's, let's house. When, when's your first open date? Has God been faithful in your life? Why is he going to stop? I understand there's stuff in your life and there's stuff in mine that's just kind of, God's allowed it there for a reason. So we can grow. So God can build our trust in him. That's what he wants for you. I can say categorically. Unconditionally, that's what he wants for you and me. He wants to grow our trust in him in 2020. Are you on board? I pray you are. Let me pray, and the worship team will come and close us. Lord, we're grateful that uh, you are committed to us. And you take the things that the world uses, and, and, and you test us. Do we trust you? And sometimes we, we don't do well. Sometimes we're a lot like Philip. We, we fail the test. But I, I'm grateful that uh, you're using those things, and you're using those failures to, to grow our faith in you. Lord, that we'd... Uh, Get to the point that we willingly, that we put our full weight on you. When, when people cut us, but we're, 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 uh, we bleed trust. Like the man 25 years out of the military, uh, we just trust is what we do. <laughs> Lord, that you would build us in that in us in 2020. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.